Greetings. Today we'll be going on a deep, and I mean very deep dive, into the Elder Scrolls lore of our favorite creatures of the night, starting from the origins of Tamriel's very first vampire, to every vampire clan and subspecies, and so much more. Let's get started. Layer 1. Vampiric Origins The roots of vampirism can be traced back to Molag Bao, the Daedric prince known for his insatiable lust for control and subjugation of mortals. In a dark chapter of the First Era, Lemay, a devout priestess of Arche, became a victim of Molag Bao's ruthless intentions. This encounter was so brutal that Lemay was left in an unconscious state. Nomads, upon finding her, did everything they could to revive her. Mistakenly, believing she had passed away, they erected a funeral pyre in her honor. However, in a shocking turn of events, LeMay awakened from her slumber, reborn as the inaugural vampire of Tamriel. In her newfound state, she acted upon an overpowering bloodlust, leading to the demise of the very nomads who had shown her compassion. As the gravity of her actions dawned upon her, she vehemently renounced Moloch Bao. Seeking solace and guidance, she invoked Arke. However, when she was met with silence, her despair transformed into anger, leading her to denounce him as well. Rahaja, a vampire from the Redguard lineage, once remarked, Our kind live in darkness and feed on life. To walk alongside us, one must relinquish the gods and accept the benediction of Mother Lemay. It was Lemay who became the beacon for the vampire cult, catalyzing the widespread prevalence of vampirism in Tamriel. This phenomenon emerged not just as an ailment giving rise to the undead, but also as a chosen way of life for those it touched. Vampiric Diseases Among the most mysterious and feared diseases are those that give rise to vampirism. One of the earliest recognized among them is Noxophilic Sanguivoria, a legacy spread by Lemay. However, it's just one among several. There are three primary documented vampiric afflictions. Noxophilic Sanguivoria, unique in its nature, the disease stands out especially when contrasted with its counterparts. Originating in the Second Era, there were instances when individuals displayed resilience against its transformative effects only by willingly accepting the quote-unquote gift would they turn. Porphyric hemophilia, this ailment's potency intensifies over roughly three days, culminating in full vampirism. During its progression in the regions of Morrowind and Oblivion, infected individuals experience a vision of Lemay in their sleep post the three-day period. And lastly, we have Sanguinaire vampiris, Manifesting primarily in Skyrim, this disease distinguishes itself from porphyric hemophilia. Transformation doesn't necessitate sleep. Instead, as days progress, victims become increasingly sensitive to sunrises, each one more agonizing than the last. The transformation into a vampire usually isn't subtle. Generally, it's marked by a traumatic event, often likened to a nightmare, as outlined in the book Vampires of the Iliac Bay, vampirism might resemble traditional diseases like cholera, but its malicious nature sets it apart. The most frequent catalyst? A scratch or bite from an existing vampire. Apart from the initial attack, victims, upon sleeping, are tormented by nightmares, signifying the impending transformation. Each vampiric affliction has its own unique transmission methodology. For example, porphyric hemophilia being notably contagious, vampires will infuse their every attack with this disease, suggesting transmission might be direct, perhaps through physical contact. Then we have sanguinaire vampiris. Its spread is more constrained, typically through a power known as vampiric drain, which saps a creature's life essence. Vampiric Traits Central to every vampire's existence is an insatiable thirst for blood. Consuming blood not only satiates this desire, but also, for most, suppresses the adverse symptoms of their condition. Interestingly, for those afflicted with noxophilic sanguivoria, the act of feasting intensifies their vampiric abilities. This power surge is potentially linked to their reverence of the vampirism cult initiated by LeMay. As mused in the book Vampires of the Iliac Bay, there's a varied palette of the blood of different beings, ranging from the rich, broth-like essence of orcs to the saccharine taste of rats. A distinct trait of noxophilic sanguivoria afflicted vampires is their heightened resilience to sunlight, contrasting sharply with vampires of porphyric hemophilia and sanguinar vampiris strains who find sunlight debilitating or even damaging. This sensitivity largely dictates their nocturnal lifestyle, 
Vampirism induces evident physical changes. Typical symptoms include a graying complexion, deep red eyes, and a gaunt appearance. This transformation intensifies with hunger, making regular feeding crucial, not just for satiation, but also for discretion. Easily detectable vampires often face prejudice, threats, or even aggression. Interestingly, different vampire bloodlines manifest varying powers, suggesting a rapid evolutionary adaptation within these beings. Vampires, as primary targets, may evolve quicker to survive. The benefits of vampirism, while accompanied by drawbacks, are enticing. Enhanced strength and speed, heightened night vision, and in some, the unique ability to influence minds, either beguiling or intimidating others, making them potent at creating allies and underlings. Vampiric diseases, before culminating into full-fledged vampirism, are rather easily treated using religious, magical, or alchemical methods. However, once one is fully transformed, the cure becomes intricate and multifaceted. Various remedies span from magic and alchemy to ritualistic approaches. In Iliac Bay, certain vampiric strains can be neutralized by eliminating the Blood Father, or better known as the progenitor of that specific bloodline, which holds immense significance in their clan. But, successful attempts not only cure the Executor, but the entire vampire clan, with some aging instantly to their death. Alchemical methods differ substantially. A notable potion from Cyrodiil mixes Argonian blood with the ashes of a potent vampire. A recurring motif in these cures involves the death of a vampire, though its symbolic or chemical relevance remains ambiguous. Magical interventions are avenues some vampires pursue. Falion from Morthal possesses knowledge of a ritual that ousts vampirism, banishing it to the Oblivion Realms. Moloch Bao intriguingly can cure vampirism, though he would likely demand a hefty favor in return. In Morrowind, the locals deem vampirism as incurable, yet Galen Rathari, a buoyant armager, which is a small military order of the Tribunal Temple, asserts that he was cured after an assignment for Moloch Bao, a claim he later retracted under pressure from the Tribunal Temple. There was another mention of an individual obtaining the cure from Varmina, the Daedric Princess of Dreams and Nightmares. Moloch Bao described the curing experience as agonizingly painful. The Iliac Bay witches drew the mages' guild's attention with their potion, an intriguing blend of garlic, bloodgrass, nightshade, Argonian blood, and potent vampire ashes. Using these ingredients, Count Skingrad's wife was cured, though the cure led to her immediate death. Other components like troll fat are also rumored to hold curative properties. Another unique potion that's been lost to history once turned one's blood into a lethal poison, killing any vampire attempting to drink it. An alternative, yet desperate cure, is contracting lycanthropy, replacing vampiric with lycanthrope blood, albeit introducing another set of problems. Layer 2 Vampires, distinct from lycanthropes, who predominantly worship her scene, have a variety of deities and patrons that they venerate or connect with their state of being. Flavicus Vile, esteemed by the Cyrodiilic Order, he is credited for bestowing upon them the ability to seamlessly integrate with mortals. The Order believes that under Vile's tutelage, they can temper their bloodlust, making their desires more manageable. Moloch Bao, as the Daedric Prince who birthed the very first vampire, Lamay Bao, and gave rise to other pure-blooded lineages, Moloch Bao is recognized as the seminal figure in the vampire origin story. Consequently, he is a major deity for numerous vampire clans through Tamriel. Even those outside the vampire community acknowledge Moloch Bao as a progenitor of the vampiric condition. Lamay Bao, once a devoted priestess of Arche, Lamay Bao's tragic transformation by Moloch Bao positioned her as the inaugural vampire. As the matriarch of Noxophilic Sanguivoria, she commands significant reverence within the vampire community. Lamay established a vampiric cult grounded in the dual principles of animosity towards both Arche and Moloch Bao. Revered as Mother Lamay by her followers, she is also believed to be the origin of the Lyrezi, Selenu, and Varasith bloodlines, which carry the names of Nidic tribespeople she consumed. Sangin, as the blood god of the Khajiit and a manifestation of Sanguine, Sangin holds the Holofane clan of Elsewhere in his thrall. He's believed to entice Khajiit with the allure of immortal flesh, possibly hinting at bestowing vampirism. In homage to Sangin, members of the clan partake in the act of blood drinking. Nocturnal, the enigmatic night mistress, sovereign of the night and obscurity, is cherished by numerous vampires. 
As creatures that revel in shadows, the protective cloak of Nocturnal's Night holds special significance. While birthed from predominantly social species, vampires often still maintain their social inclinations. It's not uncommon for them to establish clans or covens, predominantly within their own bloodlines. However, there are exceptions like the Raven Watch, which is more eclectic in its membership. Conflicts can arise between different bloodlines, sometimes escalating to full-blown warfare, as seen in Vardenfell. Surprisingly, infighting can even occur within the same bloodline, often targeting the thin-blooded or overly conspicuous members. And while it might sound macabre, certain vampires can feed off their own kin. Blood Knights emerge from infecting fellow vampires with a distinct vampiric strain. Vampires' relationships with mortals are multifaceted. While they are often viewed as prey or sustenance, some vampires elevate themselves to play pivotal roles in the mortal courts. They also might utilize mortals as thralls, some of whom might not even be among the living. The relationship between vampires and werewolves isn't strictly adversarial. Although diverse in nature, they sometimes collaborate. Yet certain vampires, like Harkin, view themselves as the superior species, with the ability to cleanse werewolves of their contamination. Interactions between vampires and Daedra are largely cloaked in mystery. Some potent vampires can even subdue and feed on particular Daedra, indicating they aren't entirely invincible to the realm's hardships. As anticipated threats, vampires frequently face hunters, especially if their true nature is disclosed. Specific organizations, such as the Dawn Guard, specialize in vampire eradication. The Vigil of Standar casts a wider net, combating not just vampires, but Daedra, lycanthropes, and other perceived threats. Mastering the hunt requires hunters to embrace a vampiric mindset, a predatory focus devoid of personal connections. These hunters, by embodying the essence of their prey, become apex predators. Some Dunmer hunters adopt protective white glyphs on their skin as a safeguard against the undead. Organizations like the Dawn Guard and the Vigilance of Stendar are fiercely committed to ending vampirism. Many ancient tales credit Moloch Bao with gifting various artifacts to the venerable vampire lords, enhancing their inherent powers. Among these fabled items are the Ring of the Beast, Ring of the Erudite, Amulet of the Gargoyle, and the Amulet of Bats. Yet, there are skeptics who dismiss these accounts of Moloch Bao's involvement as mere myths. Another artifact, the Bloodstone Chalice, stands out for its alleged ability to amplify a vampire's prowess. For it to unleash its full might, the chalice must hold water from the red water spring, enriched with the blood of a potent vampire, thus melting its magic with the life force. The theme of power absorption often brings with it vampiric associations, such as seen in the draining capabilities of the vampiric cloud spell, the ebony blade, often referred to as the quote-unquote vampire, and the vampiric ring. Given the intertwined history of vampirism in Moloch Bao, it's no wonder the mace of Moloch Bao, known for siphoning an enemy's magicka, is also dubbed the Vampire's Mace. A bug that's since been patched in Morrowind occurs if players possess both the werewolf trait and contract vampirism. They might experience a graphical glitch where the werewolf form displays a bald, reversed vampire head. In addition to this visual irregularity, there may be discrepancies in the attribute calculations. Layer 3 With vampirism comes a very deep layer of different subtypes. Pure-blooded vampires have been directly gifted their vampiric nature by the Daedric Prince Moloch Bao. Female purebloods are revered as daughters of Cold Harbor. These vampires are more potent than their average counterparts. Purebloods often view themselves superior to their descendants, sometimes even deeming them as half-breeds. Their direct connection to Moloch Bao makes them responsible for many vampire bloodline strains. An exceptional case is the Volcar clan, where the entire family received the same strain from Moloch Bao. While they pass on their abilities to their descendants, the power diminishes with each generation. Two particular bloodlines, Volcar and Lamay Bao, showcase a disparity in abilities depending on their blood purity. The scions of LeMay's lineage, for instance, have the capacity to metamorphose into fearsome creatures called blood scions. A revered and feared transformation, the Vampire Lord state is a privilege bequeathed by Moloch Bao to a handful of venerable bloodlines. Among these elites are the purebloods from the Volcar clan, as well as certain members from the Grey Host. Becoming a Vampire Lord isn't as simple as being bitten by one. The essence carried in the blood of a Vampire Lord is potent and overwhelming. Only those who can endure its immense power can ascend to such status. 
The rest are often consumed by its intensity. Furthermore, a blood relation to a vampire must provide a unique susceptibility to their transformation. In essence, if an individual can trace their lineage to a vampire lord, or one of its human ancestors, they might be susceptible to being turned by that vampire lord. For example, those bearing kinship to Lord Harkin of the Volcar clan might be transformable by either Harkin himself or one of his progeny. However, such an occurrence is rare, believed to be feasible only when the heavens are rightly aligned. Blood Scions, with the ability to utilize forbidden magic and blood rituals, are a modified member of the LeMay lineage. Those wishing to attain this formidable state must partake in the rite of the Scion after being infected with Noxophilic Sanguivoria. The ceremony necessitates the full substitution of the initiate's blood with LeMay balls, transforming the participant into a blood scion, a potent metamorphosis designed to stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with vampire lords. Notably, this ritual presents the sole method to contract this variant of vampirism. As blood scions consume more, their prowess escalates. They possess the unique abilities to detect prey even through obstructions and cloak themselves amidst a flurry of bats. Additionally, some blood scions remain unaffected by the fiery vulnerabilities that plague lesser vampires. Blood knights are formidable vampires having assimilated the strength of multiple vampires into their being. Bigger, swifter, and mightier than their standard counterparts, these blood knights often struggle to control their primal urges, adding a wild and feral aspect to their demeanor. Typically, they serve under the command of vampire lords, Lady Asenia, from Greymore Keep pioneered a method to birth her own blood knights. She amalgamated the bloodlines of various vampires using Azur's plasm to catalyze the process. This concoction was then used to infect existing vampires, subjugating them to a unique strain of vampirism she named Chaotica Vampiris. Intriguingly, unlike strains like Porific Hemophilia or Sanguinaire Vampiris, Chaotica Vampiris exclusively affects those already burdened by vampirism. Blood fiends represent the most savage and uncontrollable subset of vampires. Their transformation into such creatures often stems from extreme starvation, leading them to lose their sense of self and surrendering to their primal urges. Yet, the term blood fiend isn't restricted to these feral vampires alone. It encompasses other vampiric aberrations that don't undergo the typical infection and incubation stages seen in most vampires. These frenzied vampires arise when they're left unfed for extended periods, either by choice or circumstance, driving them to a state of madness dominated by insatiable hunger. Lord Leviticus stands as a chilling testimony to the devastating impact of such neglect. A unique strain of blood fiends, known as the Blood Cursed, are eerily reminiscent of severely blood-deprived vampires. Their transformation is alarmingly rapid compared to the conventional vampirism process. A distinguishing factor of these creatures is that their metamorphosis can conclude posthumously. For instance, after being fully drained of one's blood by a vampire, one might still transform into a blood fiend. The nefarious relic called the Lightless Remnant had the power to turn mortals into these fearsome creatures, once threatening to unleash a blood fiend epidemic in Rivenspire until it was offered up to Moloch Bao. Harrow fiends, a subset, are born from mortals exposed to harrow storms mystical tempests conjured by the Ice Reach Coven using nefarious magic. These storms rob mortals of their souls, potentially turning them into harrow fiends, emaciated creatures driven by instinct and insatiable hunger. In Tamriel, vampires are typically categorized based on their regions and ancestral bloodlines. The bloodline of a vampire is defined by the original vampire that infected them, and this lineage influences their unique abilities. Vampire groups are usually formed by those of a similar lineage or those who hunt in the same territories. Some of these groups are so dominant that they've set up fortresses and keep captives, often referred to as prisoners or thralls, whom they feed upon without converting them into fellow vampires. While they possess multiple capabilities, some, like the power of invisibility, will overlap with other vampire bloodlines. In the mysterious lands of Black Marsh, the Wet Fang vampires practice a unique method of sustenance. They ensnare their prey and utilize potent magic to induce a coma, enabling them to draw blood at their convenience. Cyrodiil's vampires, noting the Wet Fang's sophisticated methods, perceive traces of enlightenment in them. They regard these vampires as more refined compared to other savage tribes. This perceived sophistication places the Wet Fang as potential competitors to the Order's dominance in Cyrodiil. Another intriguing clan is the Vaka Shigzalt often referred to as the Sun Eaters, led by their matriarch and priestess Shigzaltzi. 
these vampires revere Sithis and reside within the Teeth of Sithis, the grandest known temple dedicated to this deity. Historically, around the Third Era, the Stormhold Prison witnessed a peculiar strain of vampirism propagated by whites. Afflicted vampires from this lineage would continually weaken until their eventual demise. However, with every life they took, their injuries would miraculously heal. Cyrodiil is home to a single predominant vampire tribe whose authentic name remains an enigma lost to time. Mirroring the region's Imperials, they've successfully overshadowed and removed rivals. When satiated, these Cyrodiilic vampires are almost impossible to distinguish from living humans. Known for their sophistication, they're far more cultured than their counterparts from other regions. With a knack for stealth, they feed discreetly on unsuspecting, slumbering victims. Labeling themselves as the Order, these vampires revere Molag Val, their kinfather, but also hold Clavicus Vile in high esteem as their patron. The Order operates under a code. Members must maintain their secrecy, amass power and wealth, and never expose the existence of the Order. Yet, despite these tenets, there seems to be a lack of a centralized leadership or hierarchy within the Order. The Crimson Scars, meanwhile, were a splinter group of vampiric assassins who diverged from the Dark Brotherhood in the year 421, the Third Era, in Cyrodiil. Their moniker, Crimson Scars, was inspired by the distinctive savage neck gashes they inflicted with their serrated weapons. Initiated by Grey Wind Blenwife, a member of the Dark Brotherhood, the genesis of the Crimson Scars can be traced back to a vision from Sithis. Blenwife's audacious strategy involved infecting the Dark Brotherhood with porphyric hemophilia, anticipating that the burgeoning members of vampires would eventually outmaneuver the Black Hand, but his plans unraveled when Salarian, a newly turned Dunmer from the Brotherhood, divulged the Scar's intent to the Black Hand. In response, the Hand orchestrated the second ever purification within the Dark Brotherhood's history. This act obliterated the Crimson Scars, sparing only Greywin and Rally Eardulf. Greywin later sought refuge in Deep Scorn Hollow, aiming to rejuvenate it as the new bastion for the Crimson Scars. Yet, after experiencing another vision from Sithis, this time indicating his disapproval of vampirism, Greywin relinquished his ambitions. Elsewhere is home to two distinctive vampire clans. The Hollowfang clan, settled in the northern part of Elsewhere during the Second Era, was comprised of Khajiit vampires who notably revered Sangin, the deity of blood. Distinguished for their mastery in blood magic and alchemy, their tribe faced decimation at the hands of the Undaunted, who intervened to prevent them from draining a dragon's blood. The ancient Tenerza Vault, known in Tagra as Night Stalkers, occupied Anaquina, residing within the Tenerza Vault Ossuary, a burial site in the Weeping Scar. Since the era of the Thracian Plague, under the stewardship of their clan mother, they have maintained a unique coexistence with the living Khajiit, overseeing their deceased in return for blood tributes. The Kanatan flu epidemic swelled their ranks as afflicted victims were transformed into vampires. This population surge strained resources. The disease decimated Orcrest, resulting in diminished blood offerings. Although the clan aimed to relocate, their clan mother, fearing the spread of the flu, ordered confinement. This containment led them to feed on scarce, thin-blooded fauna, weakening the clan significantly. Their vulnerability was exposed when necromancers raided the crypts, culminating in the clan mother's death. This tragedy incited internal conflicts between clan members, ultimately settled by adventurers who sided with the pacifists, eradicating the opposition. The Iliac Bay region is populated by diverse vampire bloodlines, each boasting unique abilities. Anthosis, Garlathai, Harvenu, Kulari, Lyrezi, Montalayan, Salinu, Thrafi, and Varasith. These clans claim distinct territories, with rivalries running deep. Notably, some vampires from Iliac Bay rallied into an undead army, conquering the Barony of Dwynan around 253 Third Era. The survival of many Iliac Bay bloodlines hinges on the life of their progenitor. Should the Bloodfather be destroyed, the entire lineage is cured. Occasionally, these vampires congregate in debates, celebrating their leaders. These debates culminate in grand feasts until only fellow vampires linger nearby. The Glenmoral Coven's vampires have taken residence in High Rock's Breton cities. While details about their characteristics remain scant, the Order of Cyrodiil regards them as one of the most cunning and potentially dangerous tribes, hinting at a clandestine lifestyle amidst unsuspecting populations. House Ravenwatch, based in Ribbonspire, is a philanthropic vampire collective led by the pure-blooded Altmer, Verandus Ravenwatch. Abiding by a stringent code of honor, restraint, and responsibility, Members commit to using their powers for the greater good. These vampires only feed on consensual subjects, 
and actively keep other vampire tribes in check. Open to inducting new members willing to embrace their code, House Ravenwatch is more akin to a clan than a singular bloodline. Contrastingly, Rivenspire also witnessed the rise of House Montclair during the mid-second era, led by Baron Wyland Montclair. This house turned vampiric due to a botched attempt to heal the Baroness with the Lightless Remnant, an ancient Islet artifact. Unlike the Ravenwatch, the Montclairs believed in the vampire's superiority and aimed for Rivenspire's dominion. This ambition was thwarted by the combined efforts of Count Ravenwatch, Shornhelm's nobility, and the Vestige, ending Montclair's reign of terror. Originating from Seraphin, a Breton vampire, the Cistrus bloodline introduces a unique vampiric affliction that plunges the infected into a profound slumber filled with haunting dreams and nightmares. This peculiar strain was named in honor of its first known carrier, Seraphin. Around 582, the Second Era, Master Healer, Viralane, an associate of the Society of the Steadfast, embarked on a perilous experiment involving veterans of the Three Banners War under his charge. Capturing Seraphin, he concealed her within the labyrinth caves below Steadfast Manor on High Isle. There, he introduced minute dosages of her blood to his patients, hoping to alleviate their conditions. Contrary to his expectations, the recipients exhibited heightened anxiety and began suffering from recurring night terrors reminiscent of early stage vampirism. His unethical undertakings were eventually brought to light, leading to the development of a remedy for the afflicted. Freed from her confinement, Seraphin embarked on a quest to find a cure for her own vampiric condition. In the heart of Morrowind, the Dunmer maintain a staunch resistance against necromancy, rendering vampires a rarity in their territories. Although the Tribunal Temple wields influence over public perceptions regarding these creatures, complete suppression of their existence proves elusive. Historically, the Ordinators and Buoyant Arbingers played pivotal roles in vampire extermination, which led many to believe in their complete eradication. As a result, the conventional hunting orders seen in other parts of Tamriel are notably absent here. Morrowind's mainland is home to ancient vampire clans with unique abilities. The Bathagorgon, an age-old tribe with the extraordinary ability to metamorphose into virtually anything, reportedly became extinct by the latter part of the Second Era. The Diodata possess the eerie capability to peer through the eyes of other vampires, and their elders can even gaze through non-vampires. The Korgari, also known as Karath, are devoid of the typical vulnerabilities associated with vampirism. Neither sunlight, sanctified grounds, nor conventional weapons pose a threat. However, they are vulnerable to water, unable to traverse it. Their mastery over heat enables them to manifest as living flames and to teleport via nearby fires. Interestingly, the Diodata tend to inhabit islands as the Korgari, dependent on Diodata blood, are hampered by their inability to cross water. By the Third Era, the emergence of the Quora clan saw them ambushing unsuspecting victims near Necrom. On Vardenfell, three prominent bloodlines dominate the vampire populace, each characterized by their distinct hunting methods. The Quora clan employs brute force, the Burn clan relies on stealth, and the Onde bloodline, composed of mage vampires, harnesses dark arts to ensnare their victims. These clans establish strongholds and often occupy Daedric Shrines, as well as abandoned Dunmer and Dwemer fortresses. Surprisingly, these clans harbor deep resentment for fledgling vampires, viewing them with the same disdain that the living do. It's worth noting that the Onde and Burn clans are exclusive to Vardenfell, remaining absent from the mainland. The Onde clan predominantly comprise High Elves, but also include Dark Elf and Redguard victims. Within the treacherous terrain of the Red Mountain, Ash Vampires, powerful immortal entities, serve Dagathur with unwavering loyalty. They share in his immense power, but contrary to their name, they neither belong to the ranks of true vampires, nor are they undead. As the Third Era drew to a close, a troubling resurgence in Morrowind's vampire population was observed, reigniting fervent pleas for their elimination. In the frosty realms of eastern Skyrim, the eerie Volcar vampires reside beneath chilling, phantom-infested lakes, emerging only to feast. They possess a chilling breath that can petrify their victims and the mystic ability to penetrate their icy lairs without fracturing the surface. Visually, the Volcar lineage shares some similarities with the vampires of Cyrodiil, including shared talents like night vision, invisibility, and manipulation of mortals. Yet. Certain Volcar stand apart with their distinctively bestial features, pronounced brow ridges, vertical lip slits, and noses reminiscent of bats. Their unique powers distinguish them further from the Cyrodiilic bloodline. They can resurrect the deceased, and while sunlight doesn't incinerate them, it does sap their strength. It's also noteworthy that the Volcar have Deathhounds as loyal protectors. 
ancient members of the Volcare clan, such as those residing in Castle Volcare, are of pure blood and possess the ability to morph into formidable vampire lords. This transformation bestows additional abilities, including summoning gargoyles. These vampires regularly use thralls as their feeding source and sometimes prey on sleeping mortals. Historical records suggest the existence of a Volcare subject in the Second Era that exclusively consumed animal blood. Solitude's archives mention another vampire clan named Snowbrood, who established Castle Thorn around the 7th century of the First Era. Using enslaved locals, the Snowbrood constructed the castle through night raids, capturing the most able-bodied villagers. After exhausting these slaves to their limits, they gruesomely drain their lifeblood, then send back the lifeless body in a macabre display within the village. Although the construction eventually ended, the nightmarish raids persisted, only to suddenly vanish for extended periods. But when they did strike, it was seemingly without a purpose, cruelty for the sake of cruelty. A pivotal moment arrived in 1030, the First Era, when an Altmer named Lady Ingerin from Clan Dyreni sought audience with regional leaders, claiming the power to eradicate the Snowbrood. She brokered a deal. The castle would be hers if she succeeded. The Nords, deeming the castle cursed, agreed. Lady Ingerian assured them that the appearance of smoke from the castle would signal the Snowbrood's end. While some dismiss them as mere folklore, compelling evidence suggests that ancient vampire clans once established vast empires beneath Skyrim's rugged landscape. Among these clans was the Night Hollow, who wielded a powerful relic known as the Dark Heart. This artifact imbued them with nourishment via void energy. However, this gift came at a cost. It rendered them unable to derive sustenance from blood, making them wholly dependent on the Dark Heart. Fate took a dark turn when the Dwemer snatched this artifact, siphoning its vital energy. In its weakened state, Lady Belaine, seeking to harness the heart's dwindling power, confiscated it. Yet in her greed, she left her kinsmen of the Night Hollow clan to wither, pinning her hopes on the eventual rejuvenation of the Dark Heart. While Somerset houses its own vampire clans, much of their lore remains shrouded in mystery. Records trace their presence back to the days of the Dyreni during the Merethic era. Notably, Osliel Dyreni harvested vampire dust to concoct potions of invisibility, making a pivotal moment in alchemical history. His groundbreaking work didn't stop there. He also devised a unique potion that rendered a person's blood toxic to vampires. In the tumultuous period of the Plain Meld, an adventurer named Aluvis was captivated by a vampire on Auradon. He described her as an entrancing woman with skin so luminous it seemed ethereal and lips that gleamed like the richest rubies. The dense forests of northern Valenwood are home to several unique vampire clans, each with its peculiarities. Among them, the Bonsamu stand out for their uncanny resemblance to ordinary Bosmer. Only when illuminated by candlelight do their true natures become apparent. Additionally, there's the Yekif who have the macabre ability to swallow individuals whole, and the sinister Telboth, who predominantly target children. Disturbingly, the Telboth often insinuate themselves into a family by replacing a child, only to coldly eliminate the family members one by one. Then there's the Krilth clan, known for their remarkable ability to transform into mist. Unlike many other vampire clans, the Krilth's feeding habits stand out as particularly humane. Instead of preying on sentient beings, they extract blood from horvors creatures known for storing blood. The clan mostly leads an introverted life, staying clear of populated regions. Notably, during the Second Era, werebats roamed in close proximity to the Kirilth. In the same era, the Veiled Heritants tempted the clan with a promise of unparalleled power, luring them out of their reclusive existence. Using the ancient skull of Vangarian, a powerful vampire artifact, they intended to amass a limbless horde of thralls. Unfortunately, many Kirilth succumbed to this deceit, joining forces with the Heritants. This dark collaboration resulted in the nearby land of Longhaven succumbing to shadowy enchantments. Numerous myrrh found themselves ensnared, led into the moors, and doomed to become the Kirill's next feast. However, this nefarious plan was thwarted by combined efforts of a seasoned vampire hunter and the Vestige. Together, they dismantled the ritual, eradicated the Harrington sympathizers, and liberated the beleaguered town of Longhaven. Layer 4 Lord Harkin an ancient Nord vampire lord was the founder of the feared Volkahar vampire bloodline, residing in an isolated castle off Solitude's coast. Harkin's family consisted of his wife, Valerica, and their daughter, Serana. Once a wealthy king, Harkin's dread of mortality led him to strike a dark pact with Moloch Bal, offering a thousand souls in exchange for a mortal vampiric life for himself and his family. But it was his fixation on the tyranny of the sun prophecy that forced Valerica and Serana to distance themselves, fearing his ambition. This obsession didn't wane with time, 
by the fourth era, the Dovahkiin entered the scene, intertwining their fate with Harkins. Aided by Serana and wielding the powerful Ariel's bow, the Dovahkiin ultimately confronted and defeated Harkin within his own castle. Before his dark transformation, Harkin was a dominant figure in Skyrim, known for his ruthlessness. His hunger for eternal power and life was such that he explored forbidden arts, eventually discovering vampirism as his salvation from mortality's grip. However, being a vampire wasn't enough for Harkin. He yearned to walk under the sun freely, pushing him to hunt for the solution in ancient prophecies. It was during this search that he came across the tyranny of the sun, which spoke of a world veiled in unending darkness, giving vampires the freedom they longed for. Over time, Harkin's family, especially Valerica, grew wary of his deepening madness. Discovering Harkin's intentions of using the tyranny of the sun prophecy to engulf the world in the eternal night, Valerica took drastic measures. She hid their daughter, Serana, within the dim hollow crypt with one of the critical Elder Scrolls and herself took refuge in the otherworldly soul cairn with another scroll. Regardless, Harkin continued his quest, turning some into vampires and solidifying his reign over the Volcahar clan. His paths crossed with the Dovahkiin in the Fourth Era, leading to a series of events that culminated in Harkin's downfall, with Serana herself standing against her father's crazed aspirations. Penned by Arch Curate Virther in the First Era, the Tyranny of the Sun prophesied an age of eternal darkness. It required three Elder Scrolls and the fateful Ariel's bow, combined with the blood of a daughter of Cold Harbor, to come to fruition. Virther, once a high-ranking snow elf of the Chantry of Ariel, was betrayed by his kin and transformed into a vampire. In revenge against Ariel for his perceived abandonment, he formulated the prophecy to sever Ariel's influence on Nern. Harkin chanced upon this prophecy, seeing it as a beacon to his salvation. Two of the Elder Scrolls landed in his possession, revealing parts of the prophecy, but before he could make headway, his wife and daughter disappeared with the scrolls, halting its realization for millennia. By 201, the Fourth Era, however, the tides changed. Harkin located Serana, and with her, an Elder Scroll. Seeking the prophecy's decryption, he captured a moth priest who shed light on its intricate layers, pointing towards Ariel's bow. With the last Dragonborn's involvement, the remaining scrolls were uncovered, leading to a climactic confrontation with Virther and the retrieval of the powerful bow. The prophecy's fate rested in the hands of the Dovahkiin, with its culmination remaining shrouded in mystery. Residing within the shadowy halls of Crowhaven, north of Anvil, Lord Leviticus is an imperial vampire with a mysterious past. Unknown to most, he is the progenitor of Agronat Gromalag, a celebrated gladiator reigning as the grand champion in the Imperial City Arena. Infected with the Blood Curse in 233 the Third Era, Leviticus lived through centuries, notably surviving the period leading up to the Oblivion Crisis. His life took an unexpected turn when he fell deeply in love with an orc maiden named Luktov Grumalog. Their love was unconventional and frowned upon, but it was passionate and genuine. However, darkness cast its shadow when Luktov became pregnant. Feeling a sense of responsibility, Leviticus confessed his vampiric nature to her. Contrary to his hopes, Luktov, horrified, imprisoned him within his chambers and fled. Consumed by betrayal and anger, he vowed vengeance upon her and their unborn child. Luktov sought refuge in the Imperial City, giving birth to Agronach. On her deathbed, she entrusted her son with the key to Crowhaven, alluding to the noble secrets it held within. Known famously as the Great Prince, Agronach Gromalog's lineage has always been the subject of whispers. While he openly acknowledges his orcish heritage, the identity of his other lineage remains a mystery. A quote from him escapulates this struggle. I am a lord's son, yet denied my noble right. I became the great prince forging my own nobility, but if I could prove my true heritage and demonstrate the nobility of an orc, maybe you can aid me. Agronach's conviction is clear. He wishes to validate that an orc can possess both noble blood and noble intent. Skeptics, like Owen, challenge his claims, quoting, Agronach boasts of his half-orc heritage, but what truly is his other half, certainly not human. However, Agronach's journey for validation takes a turn when he sends a hero to uncover the secrets of Crowhaven. The hero's expedition to Crowhaven reveals a fortress seemingly abandoned by time, but deep within, behind a locked portal, lurks Lord Leviticus. The ensuing conflict with the vampire lord unveils a journal, revealing his tormented love story and the shocking truth about Agronach's vampiric heritage. The revelation devastates Agronach. He laments his existence, viewing himself as a product of malevolence. If the hero seeks to challenge him in the arena after uncovering the truth, Agronach resigns to fate, allowing the hero to end his life. 
His death, viewed as an act of murder, catches the attention of the Dark Brotherhood, though the hero remains free from the grasp of the law. Movarth Bequeen, a Nord vampire, has a story that spans from an unspecified time in the Second Era to the eventful year of 201 the Fourth Era. Intriguingly, before succumbing to the curse of vampirism, Movarth was an adept vampire hunter. He sharpened his skills initially with the Fighters Guild, acquiring not just combat expertise, but also the knack for investigative diligence. Unarmed combat became his forte. His unwavering commitment to his cause meant that he seldom showed surprise or vulnerability. His quest for knowledge about vampires led him to Tessina Gray, who directed him towards a knowledgeable priest in Cyrodiil. Armed with insights from the priest, Movarth pursued and exterminated various vampire clans throughout Tamriel, from the notorious Volcahar in Skyrim to the enigmatic tribes in northern Valenwood. Yet, the elusive Cyrodiil Vampirum Order evaded him, seamlessly blending with the society around them. Upon returning to his mentor, seeking answers, Movarth was met with a shocking revelation. The priest was, in fact, a member of the very Cyrodiil Vampirum Order he sought. Caught off guard, Movarth was overpowered and turned into the very creature he had vowed to eradicate. This dramatic twist of fate was later recounted in the book Immortal Blood, published anonymously. Once an emblem of handsomeness, Movarth's visage was marred by the torments and transformations he underwent. From Hunter, he transformed into a formidable vampire lord, establishing his own coven. While many believe his reign of terror was extinguished a century prior, Movarth resurfaced in 201 the Fourth Era. He hatched a sinister plan to subjugate the town of Morthal in Skyrim. By turning Alva, a local Nordwoman, into a vampire, he aimed to have her ensnare and convert the town's guards, prepping Morthal for an eventual hostile takeover. The town would then serve as his fortress, with its denizens becoming his unwilling sustenance. However, Destiny had other plans. Growing suspicions culminated in the Jarl commissioning a stranger to investigate the town's anomalies. The tide turned against Movarth when a group of determined villagers, incensed and alarmed, breached his subterranean sanctum. This marked the final chapter of Movarth's dark saga, as he and his coven met their end at the hands of the very people they sought to enslave. Jonas Hasseldor, an imperial of vampiric origins, stood as the enigmatic Count of Skingrad during the twilight of the Third Era. To many in Skingrad, he was an elusive, possibly eccentric figure seldom seen in public. Rumors also painted him as a potent wizard. Despite his reclusive tendencies, his governance was notable, with Skingrad enjoying remarkable low levels of crime and public inebriation. Although he bore the vampiric curse, Jonas held a disdain for those of his kind who surrendered to their basest instincts. The proximity of other vampires to Skingrad was a concern, not only because of their presence, but also due to the vampire hunters they attracted, who brought along unwelcome inquiries. The tale of his beloved wife Rona is a tragic one. Like him, she was a vampire, but she couldn't reconcile with her fate and ultimately succumbed to a deep slumber. In his despair, Jonas sought the assistance of a stranger to find a cure for Rona. The year 433, the Third Era, witnessed the Mages Guild sending an emissary to retrieve a book from Jonas. However, hidden beneath this seemingly simple task was a covert mission to discern if Jonas was affiliated with the nefarious Order of the Black Worm. As Jonas grew suspicious of his steward, Mercator Hosidus, potentially conspiring with the Order, he hesitated to act without identifying Mercator's accomplices. The plot thickened as the Count assisted the Mages Guild in thwarting the Necromancers. In a subsequent twist, Jonas procured crucial intelligence about Manny Marco's return to Cyrodiil, with intentions to obliterate the Mages Guild. The Count, ever the tactician, only agreed to share this information in exchange for the Mages Guild's assistance in addressing the Vampire Hunter issue in Skingrad. The resolution of this predicament remains a mystery, but Jonas stayed true to his promise and divulged the crucial details. Despite his ambivalence towards the Mages Guild, he was resolute in his desire to prevent its decimation at the hands of Manny Marco and his followers. The Rise and Fall of the Grey Host a formidable amalgamation of vampires, lycanthropes, and the undead once terrorized the early First Era. Emerging from the cave city of Verkarth, they soon held sway over central Hammerfell, but in 1029 the First Era, Empress Hestra's forces combined with St. Pelin's sacrifice, managed to halt and eventually decimate them at Bankarai Pass. Subsequently, a pact with Moloch Bao saw the surviving members exiled to Cold Harbor. The Plain Meld of 582 the Second Era saw a resurrected Grey Host with King Steerich as commander for Moloch Bao. Under Rada al-Saran's guidance, an attempt was made to free the Grey Host from their Cold Harbor prison. 
Rada's aspirations included establishing Greyhaven as a sanctuary for the Grey Host using the Dark Heart. However, their plans were consistently foiled, culminating in the host's ambitions being buried in the annals of history. Lord Falgraven was a Nord vampire lord who terrorized the Sea of Ghosts for untold ages. His origins are unclear, but legends say that he was a pirate. He and his crew attacked a whaling vessel, but when they went below decks to survey their latest catch, all they found was corpses and blood fiends. He'd been traveling the Sea of Ghosts since Yzmir's reign. He would vanish for a few hundred years at a time before returning. Falgraven was rumored to be able to twist people's minds and bend them to his will. He was also said to sink ships in frothing currents of blood. In 582, the Second Era, Lord Falgraven mounted an invasion on Kyne Aegis, an island bastion off the coast of Hoffinger. The sea was rough for days prior to his arrival, and the island's defenders hadn't realized what they were up against until Falgraven's longships broke through the fog. The Vampire Lord brought an army of vampires and sea giants along with him, and they besieged the island for days. Lord Falgraven's ultimate goal was to reach the Dragon Cult ruins atop the island and perform a ritual within to empower himself. His forces raised the island, then Falgraven kidnapped a group of Nord soldiers and prepared the ritual. He was killed by the Undaunted before he could do further damage. An amulet of bats and the Bloodstone Chalice were in his possession at the time of his demise. And that about wraps things up. Hope you all enjoyed the video. See you around for the next one.